snow in parts. Um, and there's plenty of snow around. And we also have people from South America, uh, from Europe, from South Africa, uh, from Asia and Australasia. So it's very, very uh, encouraging to see you with us today. My name's Adam Dubignon. I'm one of the members of the organizing committee of Waldorf 360. Um, and I'll start by saying a little bit about um, why this course has come about. And then we'll move uh, into uh, the coordinating team. I'll introduce them to you and then we'll move into tonight's program or today's program. Here in Malaysia, it's currently 9 p.m. And for people in Australasia, it may be uh, midnight or even 2 a.m. So I, I do commiserate for those of you who have, have, a, have a tricky time zone connection today. Uh, one, one thing I would um, suggest um, because of, of time zone challenges with countries in the Southern Hemisphere um, observing daylight savings and then um, changing into standard time and Northern Hemisphere countries um, similarly at different times of the year, I encourage you to just double check the GMT time zone for your country in relation to GMT. That's the best way to ensure that your um, on track to log in at the right time. Um, so if you just uh, enter that into Google, you can find your time zone uh, quite easily in relation to GMT. So that, that's that's my advice, because it's quite hard to keep up with the um, intricacies of different countries and, and the time at which they end daylight savings. So the 360 course, um, how has it come about? It's come about um, out of a conversation that we had at the um, World Teachers Conference in the Goethe Arnhem in April, when uh, some of us came together around the need for um, a program that would um, address the needs of teachers of teenagers. And uh, some of us in upper middle school and high school are working with teenagers and for those of us on the periphery who are not in Europe and North America, where there are plenty of programs available, um, sometimes connecting with others in our subject area can be really a challenge. And we may feel isolated, we may feel alone. And in coming to planning for teaching, for main lesson and, and in our subject areas, it's, it's really so important that we understand the generative impulse, the developmental markers for the students that we're working with and that we, we come to our curriculum and our teaching in an appropriate way. And um, it's very clear to me in Asia and to many of my colleagues and, and, and those on the organizing committee that there's a need here to connect, to bring us together um, to foster conversations and, and connection among the subject areas so that you can connect with others um, and, and learn more about not only um, some of the core practices in your um, the years that you're teaching, but also um, know about um, um, areas for professional learning and development that you can um, work with. So I think that's that's uh, a really important motivation for the course and why we've come together. Um, so we've put together a program of, of 60 odd sessions. Um, and uh, the first two sessions are on adolescent soul development. And that's what we'll begin today. And uh, we'll have another session next week on this topic. And then we'll move into uh, subject specific modules. And there will also be other modules that are relevant to all subject uh, teachers, for example, on assessment uh, portfolios and how we can assess in high school and so on. So keep an eye on the program. Um, I'll, I'll remind on that at the end of, of today's session. So with us today are a number of mem members of the organizing committee. Um, I'm pleased um, to introduce David Barham from uh, the United States Center of Anthroposophy. Hi, David. And we also have um, 
Carla Nevis from Brazil. She's with us today. She's waving to you now. Um, we have Amanda Bell from um, the UK, um, from St. Michael's. We have Alan Swindell, who's waving to you now. Um, Sven Sa, also from the um, from Waldorf Modern. And we have Varashni Barut from South Africa. So we are the organizing uh, committee. I see some of our um, module hosts with us too, and uh, we will uh, open the floor to introduce them a little later in, in, in today's program. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Sven, who's going to kickstart um, today's program. Sven. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to let you know that we've just broken the 100 barrier in terms of participants. Uh, so Alan, would you please carry on what I've just been doing, which is admitting people from the waiting room. Um, I'd like to welcome you all by making you feel a little bit sad because the beginning of this course is the end of something, the end of childhood. Cast your mind back to your 12th year. Do you remember that there was something that you couldn't quite understand? The world suddenly was different. One of my colleagues described how her daughter said to her at the dinner table, Mom, why do you get more and more embarrassing all the time? And what I love about this is that this girl was unable to see that it wasn't the mother who was changing, mm. but the way she herself saw and approached the world. But of course, it's not always humorous. Some of it can be really quite disturbing. For example, when you find out that the adults who were the leaders in your life for many years cannot be trusted, promise you things that they then don't follow through, or reveal themselves to be really rather bad at certain things that you were assuming all grown-ups could do. And this is a crisis. It's a necessary crisis. And so the question is, how do you get through that? How does pedagogy, how does education help children to cope with that crisis? It's an echo of a crisis that happened two and a half years before. Many Waldorf school professionals know it as the Rubicon crisis. And there it's relatively easy because we present the young people in their ninth and 10th year with adults who can take on leadership. A historical figure like Moses, but also simply somebody who is very good at doing things. An architect, a baker, a shoemaker, for example, or a farmer. Now we need to somehow help the young people to come to terms with the fact that they cannot find this level of leadership reliably in the adult world. And they somehow have to learn to step up to the mark and begin to trust themselves. There are two ways which we do this, and this is immediately relevant to the curriculum. One way is that we show the children through the way we teach them and the content that we bring to them from now on that objectivity is bigger than human fallibility. So doing something in physics, in chemistry, in biology will work whether or not the teacher understands why it works. There is a certain reassurance in knowing that there are facts that I can rely on and they will come back. And Embracing that objectivity gives me a little bit of the stability back that I thought I had lost. But at the same time, I also need to learn to trust myself. And hopefully this is going to make you feel slightly less sad than what I said before. Try and think back to your 12th year and ask yourself, what were you good at? What could you do? Was it playing the cello or riding horses? or drawing boats? Had you learned how to sail maybe, or were you really good at football? Whatever it was, deserved to be encouraged now by the adults in your life, because it's a source of a sense of self-worth. 
if I can't trust my mum or my dad or my teacher to to step up when I need them, well, at least I'm good at this or at that. And I rely on my school to some extent and to my and my parents to give me opportunities to prove to them and to myself that I am competent. So this is a very good time to teach your children how to do the family shopping by themselves in the supermarket or to cook a family meal for everybody um, because they will only fail at it the first two times and then the third time they will know what to do. And then they deserve the praise and then they can make a valuable contribution and that is a real source of self-worth. So this is how we go through that first crisis. And I want to share with you an image of somebody who has come through that crisis and is now stepping out into the world. Cool. Excuse me for a sec. There we go. I'm kind of hoping that you can see a sculpture in front of you. Yes, very good. So many of you will know this sculpture. It's five meters tall. It's the sculpture of David by Michelangelo. And it tells the story of the, in the, which is told in the Bible, how there were two armies facing each other and a one-to-one -one combat was proposed and agreed to. And the king asked, who of you will step up? And David, who wasn't even a warrior, made that step. And this is the moment that you see in this sculpture. This young person who steps out and says, I will take him on. And this is the gesture of the 13-year-old. You're stepping out and you say, I'm leaving childhood behind. And I kind of know that there's no way back. Because having made that step, now all the whole Hebrew army is looking to David, who's standing there, and who's suddenly realizing what he's done. And if you get a ladder... And you climb on top of the ladder and you look into David's, at David's face from the side, you will see determination, courage, strength, and focus. All those wonderful qualities that we've hopefully helped the 12-year-old to develop. I believe in myself. However, that's not the whole story. When you then move around the sculpture, I promise you this is the same one. And you look at his face from the front, a different story is being told. Can you see the doubt that expresses itself in his face now? He suddenly realizes that Goliath, the enemy he's about to fight, is three times the, his size. And he may not survive. Can he go back? Is it possible for him to withdraw from this encounter and say, sorry, I've changed my mind? Not really. So that thought fills him with terror. And this is what you see in the very same sculpture in his eyes. And for all those of us who've taught grade seven pupils, we recognize this, don't we? We can see this person here who steps up and says, hey, teacher, what do you want? You can't order me around anymore. And inside themselves, those young people are quivering. What have I just done? How could I have been so stupid and so rude? I'm getting it now. I wish I hadn't said that. But you see, you can't make it unsaid. A lot of the curriculum for grade seven focuses a little bit on this question of what happened in history, for example, when people set out without exactly knowing where they were going. How much damage did they do themselves? How much damage was done to them? And did they have any alternative but to move forwards? We are faced, you see, in the classroom and at home with young people who make these choices because they have to. And they will need our patience. They will need us to see them not as 13-year-olds who are slightly annoying right now, but as human beings who are experimenting with the process of being human. And this is one of the wonderful things I want to also put at the front of this course. 
young people from 12 to 19, they don't only learn how to think and how to feel and how to do. They also learn who they are with our help. And with that in mind, I would like now to pass on the baton, if you like. I'd like to remove my own spotlight and put in into the spotlight my colleague Carla from um, Brazil with some reflections on how to support the transition into the middle school, into this new realm pedagogically. Carla, over to you. Thank you very much, Sven. Hi, everybody. I am really glad and a bit nervous to speak with you here. And it was just great to hear Sven before me because I want to dive a little bit deeper on what he just brought to us. Um, first, I would like to share with you also an image and invite you all to observe it a bit for a while. So I will speak with you about supporting the transition into middle school. And I invite you to take a look at this picture. Observe it, observe the lines, the shapes to begin with the shadows, where is shadow, where is light. Observe the expressions, right side, left side. Observe it uh, calmly. Perhaps you put your hand to look just at the at the right side for a moment. Put the the hand on your screen, and then do it, observing just the left side. Can you recognize where it is heavier or where it is more light, more mild? Can you observe that right and left are really different? In a way, we can see one of these sides of this person's face. It is a bit more roundish, a bit more lightful and joyful, more childish, perhaps. Do you get to, to see that? And the other side is more melancholic, heavier. There is more weight, a little bit. It's more rough, a little bit shadower. It would be interesting if you were together and if you could speak a little bit about that. But um, when I work with sixth grade teachers, uh, observing how the children will come to them now with 12 years old. I always like to bring this picture. And many people don't know this picture. This picture is of a child, of a child that is 12 years old. And it is a sketch for a painting of Albrecht Dürer. And the name of the painting is Jesus among the doctors in the temple. So this is a picture of a 12 years old child. And we can see that half of it is still a child and more joyful and more light. 
the right side of the picture. But the left side of the picture, there is something more, there's more shadow, there is less light, there is more, it is more serious. And in a little bit thoughtful, the right side that is not yet present. And here we have this 12 year old child that is still feeling itself like a child, but is already feeling itself just like Sven described. Um, I hope you could see that. It's even an interesting picture to make an observation like this with parents that also are in a little despair, per perceiving that their children are not the same as they were a couple of months before. And so just like Sven said, now we have like a second Rubicon. In the second Rubicon, it is uh, has a different characteristic of the previous one around nine years old. At nine years old and more or less on the end of the three first years of each septennium, we have a crisis. With three years old, the, ch the, the child starts to say, I, instead of Carla, for example. And at nine years old, we have this Rubicon. Around almost 16 years old, again, there is another crisis. In this crisis, I like to, to call them crisis of identity. It is, they are crises where the eye comes with a hard push on us and that accompanies us from uh, uh, along all our lives. Uh, but after that, two and a half years after that, at 12 years old, for example, there come an, comes another crisis, a different one. And I like to call this crisis a crisis of announcement. It is announcing us what will come next in around two or three years. And that will be the releasing of the astral body. This astral body that brings us the perception of the, the possibility of um, pondering the world and starting to make in an autonomous way judgments of what goes around me. But from the sixth grade on, when the children are 12 years old, we can already perceive it just like we perceive the movements of the baby that is still in the womb and around 60, six months, we can see where is the hand and where is the head and all that. Now it's an astrolic womb and we are starting to see that, but they are not yet free of this womb. They will be and we have to prepare them. And I would like to talk a little bit about this now. Um, first, I would like to remember a dear teacher that perhaps many of you got to know. Uh, his name was Peter Glesby. He was from Australia. And he used to say that it is really important, of fundamental importance, that the teachers from the upper grades get to know and to comprehend and to understand where do these children are coming from. And so uh, I would like to, to share with you now um, um, a kind of way to look at that. And I hope you can see here the blackboard. Is it all right? Can you see? It? Here I draw a line there. Here I will put the birth, the physical birth, where the child gets free from her physical womb of the mother. Then we have here the first septennium and here around seven years old. And here, you know, we have three moments, great moments that will uh, be repeated all over our biography. The first three years, at the end of the first year of life, when we are around one year old, we can get to the straight position, standing up. And this is a uh, uh, conquer. We just conquered, it, it's an achievement. We just conquered the first really important uh, sign of the human uh, condition to get in and not completely without uh, equilibrium, 
And we are glad, really glad to do that. And here, when we start walking, I would say the first year of life, we are strongly committed with will, this anemic, this soul uh, aspects that I will speak about. And now, um, after that, that I can move myself freely on this physical space, when I'm around two years old, now I can make phrases. So I can talk, I can move myself on the social space now. I am free to do that. And that's a second step to the human condition that is very important. A second level of space, social space. And at three years old, oh, more, one more thing, to speak. We use our lungs, we use this middle part of our body where the rhythmic processes live mostly. And so I could say that here, the, the, feeling, the feeling processes are more strongly uh, in there. We can notice that, that in many things. In that three years old, more or less, the child will speak for the first time. I, me, myself. And what is now free? I conquered the freedom of movement in the physical space. And then I did that on the social space. And now Hannah Arendt, that perhaps many of you know too, she says something that was really revealing to me. Uh, now, when I say I, that is the beginning of this possibility of making dialogues with myself. To think is to make dialogues with myself. And so here is the thinking processes that are free. So I achieved the freedom to move myself on the physical space and then on the social space and now in the inner space of myself. And that will, that shows us feeling, feeling and thinking on these three first years of the child. In here, I will have a wider willing process and four years old, five years old, a wider feeling process moment and until I go to the second septennium, here I will have this thinking process. But that will repeat, that will be repeated on the second septennium. Again, I will have first grade willing processes. And what does that mean for us teachers that have to plan and, and make uh, the, the classes with them? I have to work with more concrete, special, physical things. Then I have second grade. In second grade, I will bring them in mathematics, for example, the tables, the times tables, and that will, um, the, the, the basis that it can be strongly learned is the rhythmic activities. So I have first grade concrete activities using the senses. Now I have rhythmic processes. And on third grade, I will come to the thinking processes. So concrete after that rhythmic, and now I have organizing processes. I will get everything that I learned and I will organize it. And with that, with this organization, um, I now am able to go ahead with everything and make it wider what I do. Here I have willing first, second, third grade. Here I have feeling fourth and fifth grade. And here we begin with the sixth grade, seventh and eighth, where I have now to concrete and feeling and thinking again, but on an organizing way that is the, the last step of elementary school and middle school. Knowing that it makes it so much easier for us to understand what tools do we have from knowing the child, the children biography and having uh, good elements to plan my classes now. Well, I hope that I brought something interesting for you because on second, on high school, that will be repeated again on another level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carla. 
Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Sven, for your initial sharing. Uh, we're going to move into breakout rooms now. And the theme for the breakout rooms, we're going to move into uh, groups of five, um, is this is who I am and this is where I work. In other words, this is an opportunity for you to introduce yourselves to one another, um, about two to three minutes per person, um, just to, to warm the space and to connect with one another. And then we'll come back for the next part of the program. Um, I think Sven is going to do the um, the deed and we'll find ourselves in our breakout rooms yeah. shortly. I'm ready to go. And thanks very much, Adam. And I'm opening the rooms now. Um, please feel free. I hope you all have a common language where you meet each other and um, enjoy the surprise. So those of you who are um, following this on the recording, um, so if you're, for example, in New Zealand or in the West, in Western California, it's a bit difficult to attend at the time when this goes out live. Um, you've just missed 10 minutes of introduction of people beginning to form collegiates. Um, there will be a time a little later on to revisit those people with a different kind of question. But for now, I'm just looking on my screen if I can find Adam somewhere to I'm hand here. back to him. Here, here you are. Okay. Yeah. Over yeah. to you, Adam. Okay. So I hope that was um, interesting, folks. Um, certainly for me, it was interesting. I, I uh, met people from um, Brazil, um, from the Philippines, uh, from Malaysia, uh, and from Vietnam. And we all come from quite different backgrounds, including two of us who are Waldorf alumni who are teaching. So that was really interesting. And I hope you had an interesting session too. Um, I'm aware that we have some of our um, hosts on the course who are with us tonight. And I think I saw Robert Sim before. Robert, are you here? Yes, I am. Do you want to say hello? Can I, can, say can you? introduce yourself perhaps yes my name is robert robert sim i live in new hampshire in the united states i have been a teacher i realized the first time i taught anything was 50 years ago 1974 um, most of those years have been as a waldorf teacher um, i started off as a, a teacher of english in um, germany i taught in the freie waldorf schule am bodensee for many years and then came back to the United States. I'm actually English, um, but my wife's American. And I've been teaching, I was a class teacher here, <clears throat> but I've been in the high school for the past 18 years, teaching many, many different subjects. And I'll be doing a session, actually March, 2025 on international justice and economics. Um, and I, I do, Economics is actually the only subject I teach that I studied. I did my PhD in economics many years ago. Um, but if you look at the world, these our young people, our ad adolescents are going into. Um, and one of our tasks, of course, is to help lead them into the world. It's not a very friendly place. We have a daughter who lives in Ukraine. She works for the Friends of Waldorf Education with traumatized children and traumatized teachers. So you can imagine being in that situation. And so how do we understand the other? And I've come to the conclusion that all these subjects I teach, I teach uh, Parsifal and Dante, economics, um, history, I've taught. Um, they're all interconnected. So how we make these moral and ethical decisions mm. um, and this was mentioned um already in the in one of the introductions about um forming judgments and that's what we're help, helping our adolescents to do um then you have to draw on all sorts of sources so that's what i'll be doing in march and i really look forward to it. and it's really exciting actually i enjoy being in my little breakout group thank you adam Thank you, Robert. It's great to see you again and, and to hear what you're going to be doing. That's really exciting. Do we have any other um, 
contributors to the course here with us today. I well, see I, a man. Yeah. Who I else do I say see? I've spotted, I've spotted Ava um, and I've spotted Amanda and I've spotted Graham. And um, Mandy Foot is here as well. And oh, yes, very good. And Virajni, yes. And Mandy, wonderful. So maybe just a, a soupçon um, so that we've heard your voice once. That'd be fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll happily speak. My name's Mandy Footer. Um, I've been a high school geography teacher and a world of teacher for 23 years. Um, I'm going to be doing a session in March, three sessions this March. And I'm really looking at human beings on Earth and creating um, geographers and developing the geography as a subject that's actually critical um, to the whole curriculum because it's often a subject that's pushed aside. But um, it's actually number one, and um, I'm going to be. I'm not going to let on too much about what I'm going to be talking about, but I'm really, really excited about it. Great, thank you, Mandy. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward. Um, somebody else, Manda. You caught me. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Amanda, hi, I'm Amanda. 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 Amanda, and I'm. Uh, Sorry, I've just got doubles, but that's better. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm uh, a high school history teacher at the moment. Um, I started teaching in 1996, and I was a class teacher for 16 years. Um, so I know a bit about the lower school as well, which is nice. It's nice hearing how important that is um, for when you're teaching in the high school that you know where the students have come from. Um, in 2012, I started teaching in the high school. So I teach history. I also teach art. My background is really in art and art history. Um, and I'll be doing some uh, sessions on also on assessment because in our school, we work with the New Zealand certificate, which is a, a form of, of assessment that has been developed for ward of schools. So I'm going to be working with uh, two colleagues to present some of that, of how, how we work with assessment, as well as uh, three sessions on history coming up, I think in April, March, April. Yeah. Yes. Quite soon, anyway. Great, yeah. Amanda. That's interesting. It's certainly going to be interesting to colleagues in my school because we're also looking at the certificate uh, very closely at the moment with the possibility of uh, doing that in Malaysia. Um, okay. Um, who else do we have? Did I hear Varashni? Who did I hear? Somebody else. There's Graham and Varashni and Eva, I think. Oh, and Michael. Um, Michael Holdridge is there as well. Wonderful. Michael. Hello, Michael. Fingers on buzzers. Uh, you're, you're, you're muted at the moment, Michael. Unmuted. Good morning. I um, live in Chicago, Illinois. I started teaching in 1976 in Vienna, Austria, and was there for 14 years in the high school and in the teacher training and came to Chicago, where I helped found the high school in 1994. I now teach in the teacher training in, in our program here in the grade school and also in the high school training in New Hampshire. I will be joining uh, our teaching next month in this program in February, Life Sciences, which I've taught for many, many years and which I think uh, makes a very important contribution to this development of learning to see the world as something that can educate me, that has an objectivity and can give me confidence that I can understand the world around me and make a contribution as well. So I'm looking forward to it and think it's great that this is happening. It's great to have you with us, Michael. Thank you. Um, Varashni, are you there? I'll go. I'll go. I'm here. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> um, yes. Um, interestingly enough, and we we're just uh, speaking in our breakout room, how certain comic biographical things happened and with Carla's um, introduction or picture as well. So 20 years ago, I started in a world of school knowing nothing. So this is 20 years now. And we are embarking on this wonderful new initiative. So I'm very excited in my own personal biography as well. And to meet new teachers and developing teachers. My two kind of contributions are for 2025. And my great love of um, education. Oh, sorry. You've gone muted, Varashni. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, can you can hear you me now? Yes, could you say the last bit again? 
your okay. great contribution your contribution you're going to make in 2025 um there's two things i think i'm sharing a session also with amanda and it's about uh, this religion and philosophy i really really love that class 10 11 and 12 year and uh, we're really looking at uh, what that is for that young person or the growing and developing young person who's about to meet the world in a very real way. So I've always loved that. And I've always been someone who's been interested in philosophy and already within it, it's about science, art, and religion, which is just reverence. And that is something that has permeated a world of community and a world of school throughout. So I've always loved that because you're looking at this young person, this developing young person in their evolution and development and we guide them into asking that question who am i but my other great love and my passion is literature and we know how important storytelling is and the role it plays in our schools and in life and throughout cultures so i'll be offering something out of literature as well so um that's my contributions thank you thank you thank you thank you did, did i hear that graham is with us Graham? Uh, yes, I'm here. Hello. 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 Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for those first three contributions that set us on the way. They were really inspiring pictures. I, I've been a Hall of Teacher since 75, 1975, I think. And I've been teacher training the last 10 or 15 years, mainly. Uh, now, much online. I've been, until the COVID came along, I was in Taiwan and Hong Kong working with the science training there. But I've uh, taught in schools for chemistry and biology, mainly, but I've also been a class teacher briefly, three or four years, and then I've spread out into other upper school subjects like Parzival. And um, I would uh, be bringing something in May, and it will be edited chemistry. And it might also use the word expert in relationship to me. And I, I wasn't happy and comfortable with that. I think I've mentioned to you, Sven, just to sort of delete that word somehow. Put another <laughs> one. Um, because I, there are no experts. But but obviously, I've got some experience I'd like to share. But for those of you who might have no remote connection with chemistry, please know that I see our subjects, as Robert just said, are, are joined and link together organically. And their task is, is to bring about a developmental contribution to young people's emerging. So really, I, I teach chemistry from that point of view. But chemistry does have a hard time because it's so tied up with the hardened materialism of thinking because of the atomic model. So I will use a little bit of my time hoping to free you up as, as in, in your teaching, in your thinking about science, that at the moment science is under threat. It is really an endangered species. <laughs> I'm really feeling that more and more with COVID and climate change and other things. There is a, there is a, yeah, there's some, an issue here which is spreading through our whole society in which our young people will meet. And I think we need to, to meet that, not outwardly uh, in controversial way, but see inwardly what the forces are which are closing down free the freedom of thinking, which our young people are striving to attain. So they are really working against the stream of what is happening in the cultures, certainly in cultures I know in Europe, and, and perhaps it, it, it may measure it elsewhere as well. So despite it being called chemistry, right. I, yeah. I, I will bring much more than that. Um, so I look forward to meeting you. That sounds very inspiring, Graham. Really exciting. Thank you. Did I hear that Ava's with us as well? Yes. Uh, so my name is Ava Binamu, and I am a trained class teacher and a Eurythmy teacher. I have taught in Cape Town, South Africa, in England, and now America. Although at the moment I'm in my sabbatical in the UK, and I do some a bit of uh, Eurythmy with the Grove um, Home Ed group here in Stroud. Um, I will be sharing my experiences next year, 2025, February and March in movement, which is Eurythmy, and I have a colleague doing the sport, so we'll share that. I'm very exci excited for this and really looking forward. Thank you. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Eva. Thanks. 
So folks, time is ticking, um, but I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into the richness of the program that we have ahead of us. We have 60 sessions and, and it stretches long into the future, into next year. Um, and it's going to be a, a really wonderful journey by the looks of it. Um, I'm conscious of time. So uh, our next uh, presenter um, today is um, David. Um, and he's going to be talking about finding true meaning in the world. Um, David, are you here? I am here. Can you all hear me? Great. Finding true meaning in the world and for the adolescent is uh, actually on the teacher in many ways. And so I want to speak a little bit to what it means to those of us who've taken up this work, agreeing to work with adolescents in this Waldorf context. Uh, my name is David Barham. I was a class teacher and a high school history, drama and English teacher in schools, mostly in the United States, but also briefly in Mexico for about 30 years, which always sounds a lot until I hear from people like Graham and Robert Sim, uh, who've been doing this for so, for so long. Um, I currently am serving as the director of the Waldorf High School Teacher Education Program at the Center for Anthroposophy in the Northeast of the United States. And I've been delighted to be part of this little project since that first spark at the Gertianum last April at the World Teachers Conference. In my little breakout group, meeting teachers from Vietnam and Hong Kong and Jakarta, Indonesia and Brazil, just five of us and having that much of a picture of the world makes me realize just how right this project is and how important it is for us to recognize, uh, as one does at the World Teachers Conference, that Waldorf education is a global phenomenon. In his closing remarks to the first circle of teachers, the people who were handpicked to become Wald first Waldorf teachers, after two intensive weeks of lectures in uh, August and September of 1919, Rudolf Steiner asked these brave pioneers to embrace four essential hygienic practices. All of them remain vital today, but two, I think, speak especially to the Waldorf teacher working with adolescents. One of the things that Steiner tells those original teachers in 1919 as teachers, we must have an interest in everything that is going on in the world and that, it con that concerns humankind. It would be tragic, he says, to cut ourselves off from issues that could be meaningful from a human perspective. We must be interested in all the greater and smaller concerns of humanity and of each child. The teacher must be interested in everything that concerns the world and the human being. And that's where I wanna speak a little bit today. Of course, this is much more easy, easily said than done. And Steiner also tells us never to turn sour, never to turn stale, to remain alive and fresh in the soul. The teacher must remain alive and fresh in their soul. So Steiner gives those first lectures, now known as uh, the first teacher's course, pedagogical anthropology, known for a while as foundations of human experience or study of man. But for the teachers of adolescence, a second set of lectures is equally important. Uh, known by some as the supplemental course or the course Education for Adolescence, given between June 12th and 19th in 1921, Steiner meant this as an expansion of this early uh, first course. And so um, it's, it feels an important thing for teachers working with adolescents to encounter this education for adolescents. He specifically speaks, as Carla mentioned, about how important it is for all the teachers in a school, EC, grades, high school, to share a common interest in the children's developmental stages and to gain a meaningful picture of puberty and adolescence. In this book, he talks about adolescence being this transitory stage. As Sven said, puberty is really an ending to childhood. I always felt when I was teaching the sixth grade business math block that it was, I used to call the block the death uh, knell, of the you know, chopping block of childhood in some ways, as these young people were introduced into this next phase. So this adolescence has this really lovely paradoxical quality where puberty is an ending of childhood and adolescence is the beginning of a long and in the United States seemingly longer and longer path toward physical, emotional, social, intellectual maturity. Um, so to, co to complicate matters a little bit, and the thing that I really mostly wanted to speak about now is Steiner gives another lecture also in English called Education for Adolescence on June 21st, 1922. So this is not that supplemental course, but this is a standalone lecture where he speaks about 
what he considers the most important thing for teachers working with this age group. The heart of the adventure for adolescents is meaning. And what Steiner tells us in that book is teachers of adolescents need to work to guide students away from themselves and to the natural and technological world outside. It feels like in this moment in 2024, social media and everything wants to push teenagers into only looking at themselves and their small world of, of, of that is encountered in social media. Steiner says something unique happens at this moment of puberty and that when children arrive there, he says it is necessary to awaken within these young people an extraordinarily great interest in the world outside of themselves. Through the whole way in which they are educated, they must be led to look out into the world and into all of its laws, its course, causes and effects, into human intentions and goals, not only into human beings, he says, but into everything, even a piece of music or those beautiful sculptures and drawings that were brought by Carla and Sven earlier. All of this must be brought to them, to adolescents, in such a way that it can resound on and on within them. So that questions about nature, about the cosmos, and the entire world about the human soul, questions of history, all need to resound in them. And that these riddles or mysteries, uh, interesting, when, I'm not sure exactly how Steiner uses this word, it's, whether it's in English riddles or mysteries, but as these arrive in these young youthful souls, the primary work of the teacher is to make sure that those mysteries um, are something the student can, can find, access and pursue so that they are not stuck looking only inwardly. He says, when we have not taken enough interest in the world around us and then not brought that interest in the outer world to our students, then we all get thrown back into ourselves. He says, if we look at the chief damages created by modern civilization, these chief damages primarily arise because people are far too concerned with themselves and do not spend the larger part of their leisure time in concern for the world, but busy themselves with how they feel and what gives them pain. And of course, this is a natural human gesture and a natural gesture for adolescents. But he says very specifically, Steiner does in this standalone lecture, and the least favorable time of life to be self-occupied in this way is during the ages between 14, 15, and 21. So the very ages that we are looking at in these 60 sessions. He says the capacity for forming judgments that Carla spoke to is blossoming at this time and should be directed toward world interrelationships in every field, chemistry, the arts, history, drama. The world must become so all engrossing to young people that they simply do not turn their attention away from it long enough to be constantly occupied with themselves. Now, I'd like to just, there's a very mysterious bit of this standalone lecture, and I, I only want to touch on it here. Um, I know that, as Adam said, time is a ticking. Steiner tells us that when astral forces are freed from the physical body at puberty, this beautiful image that Carla gave, um, just like we can see the baby starting to move in the mother's womb, we can sense the astral body beginning to move inside the human developing human being before it actually comes to birth at puberty. But he, he tells us that if when those astral forces are freed from this envelope of the, of the physical body, if we as teachers have been unable to awaken the most intensive interest in the world in these riddles, these mysteries, then the energies that would arise naturally in the adolescent can go in two directions, neither of which are what we're looking for. The first, he talks about, at this moment in the adolescent's development, they start to awaken this natural feeling about their own abilities and, their, and who they are. And Sven spoke so beautifully to that. The, the teacher really has to celebrate whatever that is, whether it's playing the cello or kicking a soccer ball or uh, programming a computer, uh, teaching their dog uh, agility training, you know, whatever it is. 
he, but Steiner tells us if the child between the adolescent between 14, 15, and 21 is thrown back too much on themselves because the teacher hasn't been able to awaken this love of, of the outer world, then this young person's natural waking up to their own sense of self to, turns into what Steiner describes as a delight in power. Yeah, it sounds very dark, and I'm just going to leave it there as a statement, a delight in power. He also says, at the same moment, when the young person starts to wake up to this proper feeling for this general love of humanity, and also the specific love that can be for friends, and perhaps that special someone, that be, this is a natural and beautiful development in adolescence. But he tells us in this standalone lecture, that again, if the teacher is not able to awaken a passionate interest in the outer world, then that natural feeling of love for humanity can turn into a, um, uh, a, a interest in eroticism. And so on one hand, this descent into a delight in power, and on the other hand, uh, a delight in eroticism. He says this is, and that's, many people think that's what teenage years are. He says it's a misunderstanding of adolescents. They should feel this power in themselves in a good, healthy, and harmonious way. And they should feel this generalized love for all of humanity and this individual love for friends and perhaps that special other. This descent into a delight in power and eroticism is really on the teacher right? We need to make sure that our students are so engaged in the world that they develop in a healthy and harmonious way. I want to close with one last little riddle, mystery, that I find so powerful as a teacher of adolescence. Uh, the author and lecturer Peter Selg talks about that a successful adolescence is the beginning of ethical individualism, where individuals are ensouled and motivated by love. This idea that uh, tradition and what their family wants and what their government wants and their laws and what their religious teachings, all of this takes a, can take a back seat to a, to a human being in adolescence who is motivated by love to make decisions and act in such a way that they are working out of their highest picture of the world, their highest intentions for the world, not out of fear, not out of the dictates of outer society. And so I'd like to just leave us with this beautiful picture that despite the fact that this challenge of teaching the modern adolescent is so hard and we feel such a sense of responsibility that we can, when we, when we get it right, we can be helpers and guides to launch our students on this successful adolescence the beginning of a life of ethical individualism where they are motivated by love to do the right thing and where their natural feeling of awakening self and love for the world does not descend into a delight in power and into adolescence, uh, into eroticism. So that's where I'd like to leave my little piece here. Um, it's a hard work. It's an intense work. It's a lot of sleepless nights kind of work, but it's so potent, the possibility of, of helping and serving is so powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Inspiring, motivational. And I think for those of us who have experience working with teenagers um, in our high schools, uh, it resonates deeply, uh, this, um, this content that you've shared with us today. So um, we're going to go into another breakout session now. Um, and the theme for this breakout session is a little different. Um, we're going to look at what I want to do, what I want to be able to do, and what are the obstacles that I'm I'm encountering. Um, that's, that's the theme. Again, um, two to three minutes um, per person, and then some shared discussion would be great. I hand over to Sven, who's going to do the deed. Yes, I've opened the rooms. You've got an invitation. And you'll be meeting the same people again and different people next week. So enjoy your conversations.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, nice to have you back with us. I hope that was an interesting um, discussion. Um, um, certainly, um, I learned a fair few things in, in, in my group, and I hope you did too. Um, that, that is uh, bringing us close to the end of, of today's inaugural session. Um, this is the first of two sessions on adolescent soul development. So we are very much looking forward to welcoming you back um, this time next week. Um, and we will have more um, enriching material for you next week um, um, along the lines of, of today's program before we move into our first um, specialist subject module, which is going to be on crafts. Um, before we uh, finish um, today, um, I um, just want to hand back to the uh, organizing team for any housekeeping matters and, and have an opportunity for any, um, if there are any elements that need to be re-highlighted before we conclude our first session. Um, Alan, is there anything you would like to say um, around um, logistics, payment, all of that side of things? Yes, uh, thanks, Adam. I, I get the really exciting job to talk about logistics and payment. But um, I will make it exciting. It is exciting. Uh, what David was saying about getting teenagers engrossed, involved in the world, uh, I'm fascinated at the way that, that money moves around the planet. It really is. The first thing to say is, we're working on trust. This is a trust environment. So we trust people will pay. They're trying very hard to pay. We understand that it's not easy to move money from country, some countries in some currencies to the UK. Don't worry, we understand that. Um, but the other side of that is that we need to trust that those who, who are here will pay and are paying and the links that we share and the resources we share offer us, those of us who are have paid or are trying very hard to make the payment. We're not making a, a profit. If we make money out of this, it will go back into supporting teachers who want to develop their work in high school education. So we're not a money-making organization, but we do need to trust that our links and our resources will be held within um, and don't worry if it's if it's slow getting the money to us we understand the problem we understand the difficulty that's it adam thank you thank you alan um anyone else on the organizing committee is there anything that we've missed before we conclude things uh, if i could just briefly add something if you don't mind uh, and that is that um those, some of you heard Douglas Gerwin speak about uh, adolescent education when we launched this. And that lecture is still available for free on our Waldorf 360 YouTube channel. And so will this meeting. We're going to make this available for free and next week's too. So if you have colleagues in your country where you think this could be good for them, please draw their attention to this. They can have a test and have a look what it's like and see if they like what we do before we then hand over to the subject experts on the 24th of January. Um, but it would be wonderful to add a little bit to our number. Um, we're, we're, we're delighted that so many of you were here and we can't wait for your number to double. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sven. And thank you everyone uh, for joining us today for this session. Um, we look forward to welcoming you back same time next week. That's 1300 GMT is your reference point. Please do check that and, and please do share with your colleagues. Um, pass on. Um, um, and this, this recording, as Sven said, the recording of today will be available on the uh, 360 YouTube channel for later viewing. We thank you for your, your time today and we wish you a very pleasant day. Please Thank feel you. free to Thank unmute you. yourself and say goodbye in your own language. Make a noise. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye
Namaste. <laughs> 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 <laughs>